the Office of Alumni Affairs at Auburn University. For the next 30 minutes, your host of 18 minutes and 56 seconds, the Auburn Alumni Association Speaker Series. This is our 21st show. So all of our shows uh, will be available at aub.ie forward slash 1856 series. We want to keep this fast moving. All of our guests will talk or present or do whatever they do for no more than 18 minutes and 56 seconds. And we also want to hear from you. So ask questions and interact by leaving comments on our Facebook page and we'll do our best to answer them in the half hour that we have together. If you're feeling like our civil discourse is more fractured than ever, well, two of our Auburn professors will discuss today how we can return to a time when we can talk with each other instead of at each other. Today we have Professor Emery Service and Dr. Mike Milford. Uh, Professor Emery Service is program champion in the Department of Marketing within the Harvard College of Business. And Dr. Milford is the Associate Professor in the School of Communications and Journalism. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yes, absolutely. Look, this is a, a ideal time to have this discussion. What I'd like to start with, though, as we usually do in this show, is to learn about you as an individual and how you got here. So your Auburn story. If we can first start with uh, Professor Emory Service, your personal story, please. Excellent. Uh, I am the, was mentioned, program champion in the Department of Marketing here uh, at the Harvard College of Business. I actually uh, spent 20 years in industry and uh, joined the faculty as an adjunct professor teaching part-time. Uh, digital marketing is my background. And uh, after teaching adjunct for three, four years, uh, a full-time opportunity became available. Uh, I jumped at the opportunity and have uh, been and just enjoying my experience uh, uh, as a professor here at Auburn. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for joining us today. Dr. Milford, if you can share your story, please. Yeah, uh, I came to Auburn in 2010, and then we won a national championship. So, uh, <laughs> you know, take that for what it's worth. Uh, I saw an ad and I applied and uh, moved my family here. We've been here ever since. I love working in the Department of Communication and Journalism and I really enjoy uh, the Auburn uh, family, uh, the students, the alumni. We've really grown to, uh, uh, to appreciate this university. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing both of your stories. And what I'd like to start with, Dr. Milford, is asking the question, have we always been this way? with regards to civil discourse? That is a fun question. Um, it seems like it's getting worse, but like I tell uh, my kids, things aren't always what they seem. Uh, there's a, a lot of great research out there by political historians that talks about how disjointed our election history has been. Uh, there's a wonderful book about fights on the Senate floor during the mid 1800s. Uh, there in the election of, uh, I believe it was 1800, 1804, uh, two different candidates purchased newspapers for the express purpose of writing terrible stories about each other's wives in those newspapers. So uh, things haven't always been great, but what we have now is more opportunity to be bad. Um, the uh, uh, civil discourse that a lot of us remember uh, comes from a place where perhaps when we were kids, we weren't exactly paying attention or, or other elements. Uh, if, if there are any political nerds out there, I would recommend checking out a website called the livingroomcandidate.com. It's a collection of uh, television ads from different political uh, uh, races, primarily presidential races. And you can go back and watch some of the commercials and you can see uh, in the 50s and the 60s and even into the 70s, there's some some really harsh things being said. Um, so to answer your question, have we always been this way? Yes, but we seem to be getting better at being this way. That's, that's a great point. And, and I'd like to hear more about this more opportunity to do that. Um, I mean, part of that has to do, I imagine, with social media and the role that social media has. And so, um, Professor Emery, can you tell us a little bit more about your perspective with regards to the way that social media may have expedited this opportunity, as Dr. Milford said, to, to do bad and or good, because it, it does go both ways. Oh, definitely. Uh, one, both positive and negative as it relates to social media, is the fact that you can be anonymous. 
Now, an anonymity on its own is not a bad thing. In fact, there are people that in certain, uh, let's say Reddit forums, uh, subreddits that have very personal things that they want to share, uh, but they don't want you know, their name to be uh, mentioned. So they you know, come up with you know, fake names and, and to be able to share this very personal story to try and get advice on how to move forward. However, the, 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 the opposite side of that is when you have people that kind of behind a, a username, that, a fake username that they've created or what are known as you know, sock puppet accounts, and they have created those just for the sake of, of arguing. Just, I'm gonna go find uh, someone who says something I disagree with and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna fight you over it. And that to me, if you had to identify yourself, your first name, your last name, put your profile picture on there, mm. uh, then people might be a little bit more conscious of what they're saying. Uh, however, when they have that anonymity, uh, that allows them to maybe some of their base instincts uh, is again, it, it's, we've given them a platform to be uh, perhaps a little bit more negative than they would be if they were having a conversation with someone face to face. Having said that, can we define what civil discourse is supposed to be then? Uh, I imagine we'll have to answer that question, right? Identifying, is it just a freedom to say what you want uh, without the, the consequence of any uh, response back? Or is it more an opportunity to build awareness and to influence each other's thought process to come to a better conclusion? So what, what is civil discourse in its, in its uh, purest form? That's a good I, I wanted to connect to that. Yeah, that's a good question, Eddie. Uh, and it sort of falls on the side of what it is and what it should be. And that's always a, a tricky answer. It should be an opportunity for people who have uh, conflicting concepts about anything, um, uh, you know, uh, voter rights, uh, immigration, all the way down to uh, should we run the ball or should we throw the ball? Um, civil discourse should be a way forward knowing that we have sort of contrasting concepts and that it's impossible in a democratic society to move forward without uh, bringing others along with you. Unfortunately, civil discourse is uh, often used as a hammer uh, to uh, beat down people who disagree with you. Uh, if someone says, hey, I, I think you're mistaken or, or I think your candidate is bad or that policy is short-sighted or misguided, uh, we accuse them of not engaging in civil discourse because we don't like being told we're wrong uh, in, in debate and argumentation studies, we call that the fear of the clash, right? The idea that people don't like engaging in environments where they may be told they're wrong or they're mistaken. And so civil discourse should be an opportunity for people to come together and find a way forward. But it's often used as sort of a, a punitive tool to punish others for daring to challenge us. Hence, limiting the ability to continue in that discourse. Is um, a fairness doctrine, um, can, can either one of you explain that further? I know that I, I've seen it, I've read it, but what is it saying, fairness doctrine? I'll take this one. So up until relatively recent history, I, I can't remember the exact date, but uh, you know, in the 50s and 60s, when you were uh, a news broadcaster, you had the fairness doctrine, which kind of dictated that you had to show both sides of the argument. You had to kind of go in depth and detail to share uh, the, the, whatever the, the, the report was that you had to cover both sides. Uh, now, obviously you had even back then editorialization, uh, but you had to be very clear that this was editorial, that this was, you know, did not fall under the fairness doctrine. Uh, in, in, in modern day and recent, uh, what has happened is that has kind of gone by the, the, the wayside. So you have folks that feel that, that uh, I'm on a platform that is, is speaking to this. It's, it's, I'm only pre pre presenting one. I might kind of 
you know, yeah, there's another side of, uh, you know, side of this argument, but we're not going to focus on that. We're going to kind of focus on what I'm trying to say. Uh, so the fact that we, we don't have, that we're not presenting both points of views and allowing the, the folks who are listening in to form their own opinions after hearing both sides uh, uh, of the argument, uh, that's something that uh, unfortunately we've, we've gotten away from uh, in society today. How much of that, uh, Professor, is, is it based on your identity and, and, and feeling like your identity is attacked or maybe adding too much weight to your identity and not really looking at society as a whole and the benefit that society would have in accepting multiple identities? I'm sorry, I, I kind of blank there. Uh, I think it's, that's a great question. I, I'm, I'm struggling at, at, at how to describe that. Uh, Dr. Milford, do you have any thoughts on, on how to, to answer this question? Uh, sure, sure. So there's some interesting research on the uh, development of the parties and, uh, uh, excuse me, the parties over the years. And what they have found is that party loyalty um, in essence is declining, but at the extremes, it's becoming more intense. So what that means is there's fewer people who are associating with parties, but there's more intensity from those who do, if that, if that clarifies things. So, you know, for example, there may be fewer people who identify as Republicans in 2020 than in 1980 but the people who do are much more Republican. Hmm. Uh, they see themselves as um, the embodiment of all these different types of elements. And so when we think about challenging a, a political policy, let's say an immigration policy, for example, challenging the policy is no longer for these people a question of, um, should we uh, engage in resources to change the way our border looks and the paperwork and so on, so on, so on, and instead becomes a, a threat to the underlying fabric of democracy and identity that these people have. If you engage in immigration X, Y, Z, we are no longer America. Um, and you know, I always point people toward prohibition as a good example of why this kind of identity uh, can sometimes be a problem. You know, a hundred years ago we said no more alcohol, uh, and then a few years later we said, well, maybe some more alcohol. Uh, when it comes to political policy, we can go left and change our mind and go right, or we can take take one direction and go another direction. But when we begin to incorporate the intensity of identity to it, it becomes much harder to change because now if I give ground, I'm giving up who I am and, and uh, that's unthinkable. Sure, and it sounds a lot like is this concept of tribalism, right? This idea that it's us against you. So how do we get past that? Some of our, um, some of our viewers have asked about empathy and listening for understanding and speaking to be understood, not to be convinced. Can those concepts, very noble, simple concepts, be introduced to um, kind of disengage some of this tribalism, polarization that we that we have? Uh, yes. Um, so to begin that discussion, I always have to tell people something they don't want to hear. And the first lesson is resist what I call the church nudge, right? Uh, we're in the South. A lot of people go to church. Uh, the pastor says something particularly poignant and you sort of elbow your neighbor and say, did you hear that? <laughs> right. Did you did you hear that? You elbow your wife. Did you hear that? Now, the pastor is talking to you. And so when we start talking about empathy and and considering the opinions of other people, my advice always is that begins with you. Uh, there's that that great quote that's often attributed to Gandhi, be the change you want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. If we want our political process to have more empathy, the political process doesn't take place in some abstract lab out in some CIA headquarters secret location. It takes place at your dinner table and it takes place in line for the football game and it takes place on Twitter and it takes place at church. It takes place in all of these different areas. And so in order for there to be more empathy, the only solution is for there to be more empathy. 
and that starts with individuals. That being said, so I'd like to present two scenarios, um, TV and social media, um, almost this impersonal or not personal engagement. And today's current pandemic that we're in with takes away uh, the facial expressions, right? And limits the ability to see body language. Can you talk to us about those contrasting current circumstances and a way forward? from that. I'll leave it up to either one of you. Uh, one thought that I might have to, and again, it is very difficult in a, in a virtual environment uh, or even you know text on a screen, whether that be a tweet or something that you post uh, uh, in a forum, it's you still have to, and it's, it's active listening is something I tell my students. And you know that can be actually in a conversation or just, what is the intent? And, and you know, in, in the written word, it's it's very difficult to understand what the efference is there. So instead of immediately coming in with your bias, you know, whether you think that this is a, a positive thing that this person has said or a negative thing that this person has said, is just really actively listen. What what is the intent of the per the, what they're trying to say? What are they trying to convince me of? And sometimes that takes kind of taking a step out of yourself. Um, you know, you you spoke to tribalism a little bit earlier. Uh, you know, it, it's not an us against them. It's, okay, what is your point of view? How can I understand what your point of view is? And then maybe, is there a compromise there? Is there something, you know, a compromise doesn't mean that I'm losing. A compromise means that we're both winning. And I think even in a virtual environment, even with a mask on, uh, or if it's written, if you can just try and put yourself in the other person's shoes, to try and understand where they're coming from, kind of actively listen to what they're trying to say, and then say, hey, I might disagree with that, but you know, here is how I feel that, that we can kind of come to the middle to solve whatever the problem is, or you know, just kind of talk about, you know, as, as was mentioned earlier, you know, should we be throwing more or should we be you know, running, uh, running more you know, on our Saturday football game? There's, uh, there's several questions that have come up. In a few minutes, I'm gonna put up some tips here about ways to uh, improve on our communication, especially when we're going into Thanksgiving and we'll be engaging family members, we'll be engaging friends, uh, we'll be engaging other individuals. Uh, the hope is that this show will provide some tips and some best practices that may help individuals through this. One question that did come up is with regards to children and how to help children uh, or teenagers navigate through civil discussions in current environments who think that, and I don't think it's limited to just children, that they know everything. Because it seems like all of us are experts now that we have access to computer, right? So how do we help um, navigate through that? What advice would you have for teenagers and parents of teenagers to help them navigate through this? That's a that's a really good question. I have a, a junior in high school, and I would uh, like somebody to answer it perhaps better than I could. Uh, <laughs> my advice is to beware the sensational aspects of stories, particularly mediated stories. Um, uh, we start thinking about things like uh, Twitter or uh, cable news. Those elements are designed to keep you watching. Right. There's a great documentary on on Netflix we can watch right now called The Social Dilemma, and it talks about how they design the algorithm to keep your eyes there. Cable news doesn't have such a complicated algorithm, but they have stumbled on some generic qualities that highlight the most extreme elements. And uh, so when we talk to our kids, uh, when I talk to my kids, uh, what we need to do is help them identify the difference between the extreme cases and reality. Uh, you know, that's basic debate 101. Is your opponent's example typical? And so when we, when we hear, uh, you know, stories of these incredibly uh, angering practices by one political party or a candidate, we have to ask ourselves, is this typical of how people in government act? Is this typical 
And if not, why are they showing me this? Well, probably because they want you to watch MSNBC instead of CNN. And they know if they're boring and reasonable, they'll be PBS and no one's going to tune in. Mm -hmm. um, so my biggest advice uh, to talking to, to your teenager is, first of all, they're anxious enough. If your kids are like my kids, they're freaking out about prom. They're trying to learn how to drive. Where are they going to go to school? Where are they going to get a job? But talk them off the ledge. We have to be the calming influence. And it goes back to the church nudge. We have to be empathetic. We have to be the example as parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, older brothers, older sisters, to talk them off the ledge and help them understand the policies and procedures aren't as exciting as the tweets and the uh, news clips. That is wonderful advice, and one that I'll put in my pocket and have it ready. Um, there are those there are those family members that we meet with. Another question came up: um, How do we diffuse or not engage when knowing that we're going to? We're going to have that confrontation with a potential family member, et cetera. What advice do either one of you have with how to even approach that up front in order for it to not get to that point? Uh, I, I might be able to speak to this, and it goes to one of my favorite childhood cartoons that uh, my family watched just a, a week or so ago before Halloween. But, uh, you know, if you think about Charlie Brown, you know, Great Pumpkin, you know, the three things that you don't talk about, religion, politics, or the great pumpkin. So, so maybe you have house rules. Uh, I, I come from a, a very politically diverse school of thought as it relates to my family members. Uh, we have, you know, a lot of, of varying uh, opinions on certain matters. So we kind of have house rules that you know, we're just not going to talk about this. Uh, I, you know, yeah, it's it's probably not as healthy as it should be. You know, some the, these should be things that we should be able to talk about as a family. Uh, but we feel that you know we're just we're just not going to go there. Uh, let's let's you know, family is too important, uh, and uh, you know we've been able to you know kind of maintain uh, you know positive relations for sure. Uh, and then one other one, it's actually point number six, is just kind of knowing to walk away. Sometimes maybe before you have, uh, you know, the, the Thanksgiving Day gathering, maybe go on a little bit of a media dialing. Maybe not, you know, you know, 24-7. The, there's a great term that's been uh, maybe the word of the, of the year, but doom scrolling. You know, don't sit there and just, you know, get yourself all wound up. Maybe walk away from it from a while, kind of do a little bit of a media embargo. So, you know, when you go into those conversations, you know, you really don't have a, a current point of reference, which, you know, may not necessarily be a bad thing. <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting. I think we've hit on just about every one of these six tips um, it, throughout this conversation. And the one that, number one, remember you are talking to a person is one that resonates with me because I know we all come from different uh, points of references, right? Have experienced different things. However, we are fragile humans, but we value what we share because it does give us a voice in how we contribute to society. So we can't take the voice away. The voice is important. Um, I read an article recently, I'd like to share this with, with both of you. And it talks about how as collaborators in a great project of making society work, the norms of civil discourse are the traffic laws to help to ensure we avoid as many unintended social pileups as possible. And I thought, wow, <laughs> that's a great way of explaining that, right? Because what we don't want is the pileup. So if you can, gentlemen, if you can share, we've got about six minutes left. And I, I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Milford, if you don't mind. What is your ideal way forward when it comes to our society becoming better at civil discourse? What is your perfect scenario that you see moving forward from here? Uh, sure, gosh, uh, if only people would put me in charge for just a little while and everyone would do what I say, <laughs> right? Uh, the best way forward, there's a, a, a theory we talk about in persuasion studies called social judgment theory. And what social judgment theory is, it explains to us how people are persuaded and they are very rarely persuaded in the moment. Often it takes a lot of time 
And the most successful persuaders are those who do the most listening, right? Because you can't appeal to an audience if you don't know what their concerns are. So ideally moving forward at the Thanksgiving table, at the Christmas table, in line at the, at the game, wherever you are, listen. Do a lot more listening and find those common elements that, that you have and that the other person has. Because ultimately what we want is not to win an argument, but to win an ally. Because again, in a democratic society, I can win a thousand arguments, but if I lose uh, the vote or if I don't get my policy passed, it, it accomplishes nothing. So winning the argument to me is not as valuable as winning an ally. And if I truly believe in my political position, I should have confidence in my position to listen and find common ground so that maybe I can bring you closer to my position and we can find a way forward. Wonderful, thank you for sharing that. Um, and Professor Service, you have an opportunity. What, what is your ideal way forward? There, in the literature, there's a construct called uh, emotional intelligence. And it, uh, there are a lot of different pieces to that. Empathy happens to be uh, involved. Uh, the ability to, to kind of reflect on yourself, to be able to self-regulate. So uh, as Dr. Milford said, you know, being able to listen, but then be able to kind of do that self-reflection, to be empathetic to the other uh, cause or the, uh, to the other uh, you know, topic that's being discussed is, you know, if you you know, you might be violently opposed, but what, where is the middle ground? Where is, mm -hmm. where is the give and take? And it's, you know, I, I mentioned it earlier, but it's, it's, it's so important. It needs to be stressed again that in a compromise, a lot of people feel compromise is bad because I'm losing. No, compromise, you're winning. You're both winning. You're able to move the conversation further. You're able to see that other person's point of view. So it does take listening. It does take self-regulation. It does take, you know, being empathetic, you know, bundle all of that up together and, and just really try and understand, you know, be firm in your position. You know, whatever you believe in is, is valid, uh, but that other person's opinion is valid as well. So how can you take you know, what you are, are passionate about, what they're passionate about, and, and you know, where is that, where's that line in the middle? Where can you come together? Uh, so, you know, my hope is that whether it be online or whether it be in person, that we take a, a, an opportunity that instead of, and, and you know, you said at the very beginning, you know, talk, talk with people, see where their point of view is, see where there, there's commonality. But don't talk at, don't try and win. It's, it's not an argument to win. It's a, it's, as, as Dr. Milford said, it's, it's an opportunity for us to, to kind of come together for a common cause. Gentlemen, thank you so much for sharing your insights, sharing your expertise on this matter uh, and, and being vulnerable. Uh, as was said at the end of this article, civility is the machine oil that keeps the gears of society running smoothly. You both have really provided some insight. I know that you both also participated in a, a magazine that will be uh, featuring you at the end of November, and I thank you for that. I also thank you on behalf of the Auburn Alumni Association for taking part in this 18 minutes and 56 seconds uh, to give us these, uh, these good insights into uh, moving things forward. I'd like to, uh, to remind our guests that uh, we will have next... Uh, our next session, we will have Chef J. Rob. That's November 19th at 1130 as one of our guests. So please uh, be there for that. Gentlemen, thank you. And until I see you again, uh, stay safe and War Eagle. War Eagle. War Eagle, Eddie.